in the closing parts of Ovid's treatment of the children where we see the sufferings of Hecuba and her children. These are famous threads in the yarn around Troy, and it's not as though the tradition ignores them, but Ovid seems to pay special attention to embrace them. Uh, we've seen him take the pieces of the uh, uh, narrative story of Troy where great heroic grandeur is traditionally displayed and recast them as moments of kind of nastiness so uh, the heroism gets drained out of them and now in the parts of the tradition where the uh, nastiness is acknowledged uh, Ovid almost embraces them greedily and spends time uh, concentrating on them. Uh, the figure of Hecuba, we see her suffering and she has a kind of matriarchal sense to her <clears throat> that uh, under great loss she maintains her dignity with a decimated family. And we jump in from here pretty seamlessly into a story of the Aeneid. Uh, you'll recall our Aeneas here, our grand figure. Well, we're going to meet uh, his story too. Uh, we get him out of Troy. Uh, that, that, that happens. We're, uh, off we go and we go through Delos and Crete and as far as Scylla and Charybdis. That moves very quickly. Notice how quickly Ovid treats all these things. Then once we get to that point, there's a long digression. It goes on for almost 10 pages in your translation where we hear about Galatea and Achis, who are happy lovers. But guess what? The Cyclops loves Galatea. So all of a sudden, what is Ovid giving us? A long digression after only a very short treatment of what's happening with our grand hero Aeneas, a long digression on the softer side of the Cyclops. Remember this guy from, uh, from uh, Homer? I mean, he is just nasty. Well, Ovid starts to think about him as having romantic feelings for this you know, young, young uh, uh, beautiful, tender woman. Um, and, but the Cyclops gets all mushy inside. I mean, it's just absurdly, oh, I mean, it's, it's quite funny. I'm sorry, explaining a joke is never a funny thing. So uh, if, I, if I feel like I'm doing that, that uh, goes with the territory, I guess. Um, then, so we have a, a, this long digression on that, and then we hear about the Scylla and how she got that way. Again, it makes us kind of feel tender to the Scylla. Uh, there's a love that goes wrong, and now she's turned into a monster. So uh, there's this soft side of these monsters, and then there's a monstrous side of, of the people that we admire. <clears throat> Uh, we hear about Dido uh, and the Sibyl. That's uh, another few pages that we jump back into our story. And then another long digression. We hear Greek tales of Achaemenides. And, uh, um, and there's some more story uh, that talks about Polyphemus and Aeolus and Circe. Um, and then some love stories of people that you're not sure who they are. Remember, we're supposed to be talking about the Aeneid now. And the story of Aeneas and the founding of Rome. I mean, it seems as though Ovid would have just done that as opposed to launching off into whatever digression he felt, but he's going off on all digressions. Then we get a founding of a Roman settlement. There is war with the locals, the Rutulians. Five pages uh, of that, so, so kind of more grand, epic kind of heroic warrior stuff that happens as Aeneas is clobbering the local Rutulians. That happened in 7 through 12 of the Aeneid that we did not read for our class. Um, but there are more digressions that pepper this story. Uh, he avoids direct confrontation with Virgil, uh, but there are strong contrasts that are pre pretty obvious on first look. Uh, there is a lack of teleological thrust in Ovid. It's not as though things are all moving toward a purposeful end. Instead, it seems the opposite. It. Things are, whenever they start towards some purposeful end, they get pushed off into a digression. Uh, we've got a predictable emphasis in his story on the sorceress Circe and the prophetess the Sibyl. He likes these figures. They're shapeshifters. Um, there is a lack of prophecy. We don't have lots of pronouncements of Aeneas, you have to go do this, here's the future. Fate is leading you forward. Um, instead, there's a prophecy at the very end of the story uh, what, that shows, of Ovid's story that shows up, uh, parts of the uh, epic that we're not reading, but it doesn't figure in to these heroic kind of battles. He's got this strong quickness to follow digression. And it makes us wonder in the end what kind of a, a Rome or Romanness is Ovid imagining. Um, we've got order on the one hand. Uh, these uh, our, our beautiful ruins over here have fallen down, but imagine them up and straight and beautiful, and disorder on the other of things just all falling apart. In Ovid, the world is kind of struggling between these two potential strong forces, order on the one hand, disorder on the other. Uh, disorder, in the end, kind of seems stronger, doesn't it? And anything that seems stable is always about to change. Disorder upends it. Uh, there's internal conflict, uh, passion versus duty. Passion almost 
always wins out not to be known as exonerated for that it's not embraced they get awfully punished but it just shows that things don't quite work out the way humans would want them to we have a close in look at everyday life small people in the middle of grand circumstances and we've got this kind of fumbling march toward some kind of an end point who knows what it is well in the end of it tells us at the end of his metamorphoses it is indeed Rome and it is indeed Augustus and he doesn't seem to have his tongue in his cheek while he's talking about that uh, it seems to be quite serious of that uh, well, what what he means the grandeur of Rome and the grandeur of Augustus but at the as a closing uh, uh, tale on an epic that's built on change and uh, and un instability uh, the idea of Roman permanence and stability uh, at least uh, somewhat subtly is a bit undercut by the way Ovid has told his story up till now. So this is a poet that's really interested in how this uh, grand vision of a, a, a monumental Rome uh, may have some creaky pieces to it and stability for all time uh, as is imagined by political leaders who knows uh, is probably not something that Ovid is ready to say is going to happen forever and ever and ever. After all, things all change. Um, that uh, this may be connected somehow with uh, the reasons why Ovid was exiled. But as I said at the beginning of our treatment of Ovid, oh, we just don't know. We're not sure why he had to spend all that time out there. But he did uh, not, um, uh, he did something to uh, displease uh, Augustus. And that's never wise.